Previously, I spoke about the electrical phenomena inherent to nerve and muscle tissue, as well as some of the specialized electroreceptors that allow various vertebrates to detect and perceive even weak electrical fields. In many fish species, this passive perception is combined with an electrical organ that generates an electrical field allowing for electrolocation. This is something of an equivalent to using echolocation rather than passively listening for sound. In a few species, the electrogenic organs are larger and more well-developed, allowing the fish to generate a much stronger electrical field. Strong enough to stun, sometimes strong enough to kill. A rather unique means of both attack and defense. So let us look more closely into the anatomy of these living batteries and see how they are used in the various species of electric fish. To begin with, what does the electrogenic organ of a typical electric fish look like? In its simplest terms, a typical organ of this sort consists of stacks of flattened cells. These cells are physiologically similar to muscle cells, though they lack the ability to contract. They are commonly known as electrocytes, as they are the source of the electrical fields these fish generate. Beyond the cellular level, there is considerable variation in the overall size, shape, and placement of the electrogenic organs in the various fish species. However, there are some patterns that are more common than others. Only a relative handful of species can generate an electrical field strong enough to use for hunting or defense. The rest, sometimes regarded as weak electric fish, tend to have a relatively uniform pattern. In these species, the electrical organ is typically located somewhere within the tail, although it may extend forward some distance through the body. It is relatively small and generally quite slender, and easy enough to overlook among the other internal structures. The organs of stronger electric fish have comparable cell structures to those of the weak electric fish. There are simply a lot more electrocytes, often gathered into larger stacks. Like neurons and muscle cells, electrocytes maintain a resting voltage across their membranes by a combination of the sodium-potassium pump and a few potassium leakage channels. However, they have a few key differences. First, as mentioned before, these cells are flattened. One surface, let us call it the back, is relatively smooth, while the opposite surface, the front, is a bit more wrinkled. While at rest, these cells maintain a high concentration of sodium ions outside and a high concentration of potassium ions inside. Both of these types of ion are positively charged, so they function as positive charges for electrical purposes. While at rest, the leakage of potassium ions out of the cell causes the interior to become negatively charged, while the exterior becomes positively charged. To oversimplify for the sake of clarity, the potassium ions want to leave the cell because there are more inside and fewer outside. However, they also want to enter the cell because the inside is negative and the outside is positive. Chemically, they're pushed out. Electrically, they're pulled in. When these two pressures balance out, we get our resting voltage for the electrocyte. Now, only the back of the electrocyte has any nerve connection. An axon connects with the back surface, often at multiple points. When a nerve signal travels down the axon, it releases a neurotransmitter, typically acetylcholine, onto the electrocyte. Sodium channels open in response to this release, and sodium ions begin to flow into the electrocyte, but only through the membrane on the back. Voltage-gated sodium channels open in response to these initial shifts, further enhancing the movement of these ions. Very quickly, the inside of the cell membrane develops a positive charge, while the outside becomes negatively charged. Now, the potassium ions have every reason to leave the cell, as both the chemical and electrical gradients are effectively pushing them out. 
and so they leave quite rapidly from the front surface of the electrocyte. The overall effect is this. Positive charge rushes forward through the cell. Charge in motion is current, and if positive charges are moving forward, they are separating from negative charges. In this way, a voltage is developed across the entire electrocyte. In a sense, just for a moment, the cell has become a tiny active battery capable of generating a minuscule amount of electrical current. However, this is only the beginning. As it turns out, if you line up a bunch of batteries from end to end, connecting them in a series, the voltage generated by each battery stacks up. In other words, if you took 10 batteries that generated 1 volt each and hooked them up end to end, you would generate 10 volts from the entire array. Now imagine thousands upon thousands of electrocytes all stacked up together, each generating a few millivolts. Imagine several stacks of these cells side by side, collectively forming the electrical organ of a fish. The collective voltage generation becomes large enough to generate an appreciable electrical field in the water around the creature. However, it should be noted that the electrocytes typically need time to reset their ion concentrations. Thus, no electric fish generates a constant voltage. Instead, the voltage is generated either in pulses or in waves. In this regard, it is once again somewhat equivalent to echolocation. Sound is commonly produced in brief distinct calls rather than a constant scream. Thus, electrolocation involves taking a series of sort of electrical snapshots of the environment. These momentary glimpses might easily flow together in neural processing, just as a series of still images shown in rapid succession may take on the appearance of a moving picture. Still, that is merely speculation on my part. In any case, let us consider a few groups of weakly electric fish. In the oceans, one group of interest is the skates in the family Ragidae. These flattened fish are cousins to the sharks and often rest on the ocean floor waiting to ambush prey. Many species of skates have electrogenic organs, but they appear to be too weak for proper electrolocation. Instead, it seems likely that they use electricity for communication. They do have the electrical sensors common to fish with cartilaginous skeletons, so perception of electric fields is no issue for them. There is the additional benefit of effectively communicating using a medium that most other species are essentially unaware of. Moving on to freshwater, we come to the Mormiridae, sometimes known as elephant fish. This common name is due to the fact that a great many species in this family have elongated snouts, at least at a glance. In some of these species, the snout is actually an extension from the lower jaw, with the mouth visible at the top. These fish are found in various bodies of water throughout Africa, depending upon the species. Some, like Nathonemus petersi, are also often placed in aquariums. Interestingly, the genus name Nathonemus roughly translates into jaw thread, no doubt a reference to the fleshy protuberance descending from the lower jaw in this species. The reason for this protuberance becomes clearer when one considers the environment these fish live in, as well as the foods they seek out. They tend to live in quite murky waters, and they often feed on invertebrates found in the mud of riverbeds. They have electrical receptors in the skin over much of their body, and these receptors are especially concentrated in this protuberance. It acts as a detector for potential food hiding away in the mud. Interestingly, this particular species has a relatively large brain for its body size. Some have speculated that this large brain is necessary for properly interpreting the distortions in the modest electrical field it generates. However, this fish is also known to modulate its electrical pulses in a manner that seems vaguely akin to the sound modulations in human speech. There are varying patterns, pauses, and the like. As with the skates, such communications are made covert by the medium they use. Most of the species these little fish live alongside are entirely unaware of their electromagnetic conversations. 
Another group of weak electric fish is commonly known as knife fish, though in actuality this may be subdivided into two groups. There are the African knife fish, represented by the species Gymnarchus niloticus, and the South American knife fish in the order Gymnotiforms. A typical knife fish looks more or less like an eel, though they are distinct from proper eels. They are long, slender fish that often have an outline reminiscent of the blade of a knife. Most species tend to move by the controlled undulation of a fin extending from their underside along most of their body length. Like the Mormirids, these fish also tend to live in murky waters and so rely on their electrolocation rather than eyesight. Somewhat amusingly, there are species of knife fish that can swim backwards just as readily as they move forward. While most of these fish are only weakly electric, this group does include the famous electric eel. However, I think I will save this particular creature for last. For the moment, let us consider a particularly unusual sort of electric fish found in the oceans of the world. The stargazers are a group of fish that have eyes set in the tops of their heads, giving them a perpetual upward gaze. The jaws are also turned upward, giving these particular fish a rather severe scowl. This arrangement makes a fair degree of sense, as stargazers tend to be ambush predators that bury themselves in ocean sediment. Some species employ lures in a manner not unlike that of anglerfish, others simply rely upon camouflage and surprise. The family of stargazers is the Uranoscopidae, which translates roughly into sky watchers. Within this family are two particular genera, Uranoscopus and Astroscopus, the Sky Watchers and the Star Watchers. The fish in these genera possess electrogenic organs in their heads, derived from slightly different muscles in the two groups. However, these fish are apparently entirely lacking in the sorts of electrical receptors seen in most electric fish. They apparently use electricity strictly as a weapon to help subdue the prey that they ambush. This is not the case in another group of strong electric fish in the ocean, the electric rays. These rays are dorsoventrally flattened and tend to have a rounded and almost flabby sort of appearance. They often come off as a bit sluggish and almost cuddly. However, there are species in this group that can generate voltages and currents sufficient to stun a human. These rays are in the order Torpidiniforms, and many of these flattened fish are commonly known as torpedoes. It may seem a bit odd for such relaxed fish to be apparently named after the sleek, swift underwater weaponry that any naval warfare enthusiast would be familiar with. Indeed, it is odd, because these fish were not named after torpedoes. It was, in fact, the other way around. The torpedoes were named after the fish. The word torpedo is derived from the Latin word for numbness or paralysis. We get the term torpor from the same root. A defensive shock from one of these torpedoes does often cause numbness for some time afterward. Many species in this group are commonly called numbfish, in fact. To make things all the more amusing, there are three major families within the torpidiniforms. These are the torpidinidae, narcinidae, and hypnidae. The first of these families shares the same Latin root for numbness. The second family derives its name from the Greek root for numbness, or stupor. This is the same root we derive the words narcotic and narcosis from. The third family gets its name from the Greek root word for sleep. It is the same root found in the word hypnotism or hypnosis. One cannot help but suspect there might be a central theme somewhere in all of this nomenclature. Regardless, the fish in these families are quite interesting as electric fish go. As they live in seawater, their electrogenic organs are somewhat different to those of strong electric fish found in freshwater. The freshwater fish tend to have a number of very long stacks of electrocytes running along the axis of the body. These stacks generate a collective positive pole at the front and a negative pole at the back. With the torpedoes in their kin, this arrangement is turned on its side. The electrical organs in these fish are a pair of flattened kidney-shaped structures located in the fins on either side of the head. Electrocytes are arranged vertically here rather than horizontally, and when they activate, 
The resulting electrical field involves a positive charge on the upper surface of the fish and a negative charge on the lower surface. As might be expected by this arrangement, particularly in such a flattened fish, the electrocyte stacks are shorter than those seen in strong electric fish found in freshwater. However, there are a lot more of these stacks. In effect, the batteries are connected in parallel rather than in series. This arrangement means that these fish generate less voltage, but more current. This is sensible enough, as less voltage is necessary in salt water compared to fresh water. That said, the Atlantic torpedo Tetronarsi nobiliana can generate up to 220 volts. Other interesting species in this group include the coffin ray Hypnos monoterygius, the bullseye electric ray Diplobatus omata, and the common torpedo with a scientific name Torpedo Torpedo. The coffin ray is the only known species in its genus and family. The bullseye electric ray is distinguished by a prominent spot near the middle of its back, which does somewhat resemble a bullseye. The common torpedo is simply amusing because its common name and scientific name are simply repetitions of the Latin word for numbness. Very roughly translated, its scientific name means num num. Moving on to the freshwater denizens, we find the electric catfish, Melapterurus electricus. This creature has an electrical organ that wraps around most of its body just beneath the skin. It can typically generate up to 450 volts, which is more than enough for subduing prey and defending itself from predators. The electric catfish is found in Africa and is one of the inhabitants of the Nile. As such, it was familiar to the Egyptians since ancient times, and depictions have been found in certain tombs. Apparently, the shocks of the electric catfish are sometimes used to alleviate the pain associated with arthritis. I'm not certain whether I would embrace such a treatment personally. There are a fair number of species of electrogenic catfish within the family Melapteruridae, though the aforementioned electric catfish is likely the strongest in the group. Among catfish in general, also known as the order Siluriforms, it is very common to at least have electrical receptors. After all, a great many catfish are bottom feeders found in murky water, and such electrical perception would be quite valuable for locating food. Last of all, let us consider the electric eel, long regarded as a single and rather infamous species. In fact, the electric eel consists of three known species within the genus Electrophorus. Not surprisingly, this genus name translates roughly into electricity carrier. It may be worth noting that the Greek word electron often refers to amber, a substance that can hold a charge of static electricity. The three species of electric eel are Electrophorus varii, Electrophorus voltae, and Electrophorus electricus. They are all found in the Amazon region of South America, with relatively little overlap in their ranges. Minor details aside, they are all quite similar. For the sake of simplicity, I shall be referring to Electrophorus electricus moving forward, as it is essentially the type species for the genus. The electric eel is extremely specialized for electricity generation, and is capable of producing up to 860 volts. Internally, most of its body is filled by three electrical organs. The smallest of these generates weak electrical fields for electrolocation. The other two apparently generate the stronger fields used in defense and predation. Collectively, these organs more or less fill the posterior three-fourths of the creature's body. The other viscera are crowded together in the front of the body cavity just behind the head. When activated, the electrical field is much like that seen in other freshwater electric fish, with the positive pole at the front of the body and the negative pole at the back. However, the electric eel can bring the front and back of its body close together to generate an especially intense electrical current in the narrow gap between these two regions. To make things all the more interesting, this fish appears to hunt by delivering a large electrical shock sufficient to stun prey and force any hiding prey to twitch uncontrollably. These twitches readily give them away. One might ask incidentally just how an electrical field causes such twitching. 
To answer briefly, we come back to the membranes of muscle cells and neural axons. These spans of cell membrane have voltage-gated sodium channels. When subjected to the proper shift in voltage, these channels open and propagate an action potential along the axon or over the muscle cell. This property is vital for proper action potentials to occur. However, it also allows these cells to be hacked by any significant change in voltage like, perhaps, that generated by the sudden massive electrical field generated by a certain eel. This forces the channels open, causes action potentials throughout the body, and results in uncontrollable muscle spasms. It also tends to be quite painful, as pain receptors are also activated by these voltage shifts. Beyond their electrogenic properties, the electric eels have a few other unusual biological quirks. They often inhabit stagnant water, and as such, they breathe air. They do this by taking a gulp of air from the surface every couple of minutes or so. They have a frilly sort of mucous membrane inside of their mouth cavities, which allows for efficient oxygen absorption from the air before it exits through the gills. Meanwhile, carbon dioxide tends to diffuse out into the water through the skin. These eels have poor eyesight, but fairly decent hearing, their bodies tend to be a bit sluggish, as so much of their body mass is taken up by the ample electrical organs. Still, such fish do not need to be especially athletic, when they can render any nearby prey immobile and helpless with what amounts to little more than a thought on their part. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have enjoyed today's little foray into the unknown. If you are still curious and wish to venture a little further, here are a few things you might consider looking into. If you found this video enjoyable, do feel free to leave a like. If you believe others might enjoy it, by all means, share. If you wish to see more of this channel, a subscription should prove quite helpful. Until next time.